Welcome, uh, welcome back. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Uh, depends on where you are. So this is number six of our public lecture series. Let me share my slides with you first. Um, so let me share this one. All right, slide this up. All right, uh, my name is Jean Yang. I'm the director of the Institute for Corporate Governance, the ICG at Cali School of Business Indiana University. The ICG was founded in 2004, and our goal is to promote research that advances corporate governance theory, informs policy debates, and influences organizational practice. So the ICG has hosted a series of public lectures on new challenges faced by corporate boards and new opportunities presented by big data a new technology. So today we have lecture six of the series. We thank the ECGI, the European Corporate Governance Institute, and more specifically, Marco and Elaine for their support. We also thank IU's Austrian Workshop for co-hosting the public lecture series. Thank you, Scott, for supporting us with the whole series. We have launched two mini series at this point. The first one is governance by institutional investors. Today we have indexing and corporate governance. So essentially Todd Gormley from Washu is going to discuss what's the impact of passive investors on corporate governance. The video today, the slides and the write up to the Q and A's for the Q and A's will be emailed to you uh, if you register for the event. And last month we have a related discussion looking at the influence of hedge fund activism. So that's titled Governance by Persuasion by Professor uh, Bra from Duke University. That material, uh, materials related to that lecture was already posted on our uh, website. If you have questions about those, please feel free to reach us. The second mini series is on data and technology. So Professor Wei Jiang from Columbia University started with how big data and new technology affects and perhaps transforms corporate governance practices. And then we have two lectures on data governance. The first one was in February, who owns your data? The next one is scheduled for the coming month, the future of cybersecurity. So Justin, Charlie and Jeffrey from McKinsey Company will lead that discussion. And Professor Angie Raymond, my colleague at IAU will moderate that public lecture. So that's our lecture number seven. More for today. Today's speaker is Professor Todd Gormley. Todd is a friend and Todd is a professor of finance and the finance area chair at All in School of, uh, All in Business School at Washington University in St. Louis. That's where I received my PhD. So that's dear to my heart. Todd received his PhD in economics from MIT and then joined All in 2006. He moved to Wharton School in 2009 before returning to All in more permanently in 2016. Todd's earlier research focuses on why managers sometimes fail to react on the best interests of shareholders and what governance and ownership arrangement might help mitigate these conflicts. His more recent work has analyzed the impact of passive institutional investors rise on stewardship and firms. Using his own terms, passive investors, not passive owners. Hopefully I didn't get it the other way around. And Todd research has been featured in major media and won numerous best paper awards. Todd previously served as an associate editor at a review of financial studies and currently serves as an associate editor at Journal of Financial Economics. These two are among the top three finance journals. A review of finance and Journal of Financial Quantitative Analysis. Uh, I will pass the podium and the screen to Todd. Todd, you will have 45 minutes. After that, we will have 10 to 15 minutes for Q&As. 
So without further ado, Todd, the podium and screen is yours. All right, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, June. Uh, let me go ahead here and share my screen. Okay, one second here. All right, everything look good? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, uh, so let me just dive right into it. Um, I think it's pretty well known that indexing investment products uh, have become very popular over the last couple of decades uh, with investors, right? And you can see an example of that here in the figure I put up on this slide in that the share of fund assets, meaning like mutual funds or ETFs that is indexed uh, has quadrupled over the last 20 years, right? So we went from less than 10% of those assets being indexed back in 2000 to now around 40%, right? And it continues to increase, right? I think something else that's important about this industry and this growth of indexing is that this market is really dominated by three asset managers, at least here in the US, right? And, and who I'm referring to here is Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street, right? Indexing is their primary uh, line of business. Uh, these three institutions account for about 75 to 80% of all the indexed assets here in the US. And so as this market has grown in size, so have these three institutions, okay? And to be clear here, their growth has made them really, really large uh, in really important stock owners, right? And, and this table is just an illustration of that. So this table just ranks asset managers based on their total assets under management. So this is a global assets. And you can see that BlackRock is number one, Vanguard's number two, and State Street's number five, right? And if I had done this with just US assets under management, they would have been one, two, and four, right? And because of their size, this is why many refer to them as the big three, right? And just as another illustration of how important they might be, right? You can just look at the ownership of an average US public company, right? Nowadays, these three institutions collectively own about 16% of an average US public company, right? And their ownership stake is even larger in the bigger firms, right? So if you look at an S&P 500 company, uh, because the S&P 500 is a really popular benchmark for these index funds, Right, these three institutions own about 20% of every firm that's in the S&P 500, right? And as recent research has pointed out, they account for an even larger share of the voting, right? And that many investors don't vote their shares. And so now we have the big three accounting for about a quarter of the votes for firms in the S&P 500, right? So they're very, very big and potentially quite important, right? And so I think the growth of indexing uh, and the big three has led to a lot of questions in terms of what is going to be the impact of this on financial markets and how companies are run. Uh, and what I would like to do in my talk uh, is focus on what I think of as two of the bigger questions that have been sort of posed in the literature and sort of my assessment of what we have found so far, right? And so the first question is, how does this shift in ownership towards indexing? affect governance? How does it affect the monitoring, the stewardship of these companies? The second question is, how does the fact that indexing tends to lead to a lot of overlap in the ownership, i.e. common ownership, does that affect managers' incentives? And is it affecting the choices that companies make? Right, so that's the second big question. And then I'd like to end my talk with the discussion of what I think are the other sort of remaining questions that we don't know as much about and where I kind of think the literature needs to go next, okay? So that's sort of how I'm gonna organize my talk. I'm gonna break it into these three pieces. All right, but before I do that, uh, let me just put out a few caveats. Uh, one, uh, the literature on indexing is very large. Uh, and you know, there are a lot of papers that look at their impact on stock market liquidity, uh, volatility, price co-movements, price efficiency, I think that's all equally important and interesting research, uh, but my presentation is really gonna be focused on their governance implications, right? So that's why I'm not gonna talk about that other aspect of the literature. 
The second thing I want to highlight here is that there are a lot of papers uh, in this literature, uh, and there are going to be papers that I don't cite uh, and don't mention. Uh, and I'm really just trying to paint in very broad brushstrokes what I think are sort of the main themes that have come out of the existing literature. And as part of that, I'll be highlighting certain papers along the way uh, that I think help do that. But acknowledging that there is yet more research that I, I'm not necessarily citing. The third thing I want to emphasize is I'm going to try to be careful in terms of how I describe things. In particular, I'm going to use the word indexing rather than passive, um, because I think the use of passive uh, to describe these investors is a bit confusing um, in terms of with indexing, it's clear what we mean. We're talking about their investment strategy, right? And from there, we can then ask, all right, does the growth of this investment strategy matter for uh, outcomes? Right. Whereas passive, it's a little bit unclear what we're referring to. And honestly, I'm guilty of this as well in some of my earlier work. So I'm going to refer to indexing rather than passive. Okay. And the second thing is I'm often going to describe findings in the literature as being driven by the big three. Right. Because honestly, the decisions being made are at the fund family level. These are the three institutions that dominate that market. So when we're talking about indexing having an impact, we're in essence really talking about the big three as well. Right. And so even though the papers I might refer to didn't sort of imply that this is being driven by the big three, I often will do that myself when I describe those papers. OK. All right. So with those caveats out of the way, uh, let's dive in. All right. So part one, uh, I want to focus on what the potential impact of this growth in indexing and the shift in ownership is on stewardship, on governance, on the monitoring of managers. So I'll start off with just sort of Here's what the initial debate was in terms of why this might be good or bad for governance. Uh, and then I'll dive into the evidence. And I've kind of broken that into three pieces in terms of what's their direct impact on firms' governance structures, what's their indirect impact through other investors, and then evidence in terms of how active are they relative to other investors in the market, right? Sort of their degree of activism. Okay. All right. So. I think it would be fair to say that the initial take on how this growth in indexing uh, might affect governance was a negative one, right? Uh, in terms of that, there was a view that this could be bad for governance. Uh, and I think this sort of quote that I pulled from The Economist in early 2015 is a good illustration of that, right? So as this economist quote states, they're basically noting that these index funds, these ETFs, they seem to be focused on minimizing track and error, minimizing expenses, and the economist basically says they take little interest in how firms are run. It also calls them lazy investors, right? So basic idea is this is going to be bad for governance to have these lazy investors holding all these stocks, right? And then the article goes on to basically argue, hey, this is making the case that we need more of these activist investors out there to offset this, okay? Now, there obviously was pushback on this view, particularly among the big three, right? They were very vocal in countering this and writing op-eds having open letters from the CEO that basically said, no, uh, we do care about how these companies are run. We are monitoring, we are concerned about governance um, and that if these companies are doing well, we're gonna benefit, right? And so they really tried to distinguish their investment strategy from what they do as an owner, right? And so Vanguard, I think was the first to kind of coin this term or phrase uh, of them being passive investors, not passive owners, right? There's a distinction between that investment strategy and what you do as an owner, okay? Now, to be clear here, there are good arguments on both sides of this debate. Uh, and so in terms of why their growth could weaken governance, um, there are three things that people often point to. One is this idea that these, these indexers kind of lack all the typical levers of influence that an investor might have by which they could exert influence, right? So in the governance literature, we often think of institutions as exerting influence through a combination of voice and exit. Right. Well, now, if we're talking about an indexer, uh, they can't easily exit their position, so they don't have that sort of lever, right? They can't do that Wall Street walk, and then the question is, is well, if they don't have that threat of exit, can they really exert a lot of influence? There's also been concerns raised about their motivation to be engaged, right? And that it seems like they're focused primarily on minimizing track and error. They compete on minimizing expenses, and because their expenses are such a small proportion uh, of the overall assets and management, like if they improve the performance of a firm in their portfolio, you know, they, they get very little of that benefit, right? And given that, it's a question of, do they have good incentives here? 
And then third, a lot of raised concerns about just, do they have the resources? Do they actually have the time? Many would argue that it's just implausible to think that they do, right? These institutions, by the nature of their products, they hold thousands and thousands of stocks, right? But then you might have an institution that only has on average 20 individuals in their proxy voting group that's making the decisions of how they're gonna vote on all the proposals for 10,000 different companies. Do we really think that they have the information to really help on these firm specific monitoring? Okay. So those are the arguments against. Now, many of these you could actually kind of flip and argue that, well, they could actually be good for governance in some dimensions, right? So for example, the fact that they can't exit, some would say, well, that actually makes them care more about governance right? And that they're kind of stuck holding these companies. They can't just sell the position. And so therefore they have to be engaged with their voice to try to enact change, right? Additionally, they'll point out that, hey, because they can't exit, they really do care about the long-term. Maybe that's a good thing from a governance perspective. Second, they might have many reasons to be motivated, right? So it's possible, you know, by their sheer size that, yeah, their expenses are quite low, but if they can improve the value of a firm in the portfolio, because they're so large and they have such large positions, they actually might have a decent financial motive to be engaged. And then there are other reasons why they could be motivated as well. And I'll talk about those at the end of the talk. And then third, people just kind of point out, hey, these institutions are massive, right? And their size is by its nature gonna give them a lot of influence, right? It's gonna mean that they're often the pivotal voter, right? And if you're kind of benchmarking them against these small dispersed retail investors, if they're replacing that, then you could arguably say, yeah, they're going to be more influential. The free rider problem uh, applies less to them. This could be good for governance. Okay. So it can go either way. And so it really has become an empirical question in terms of what their impact is on governance. Now, this is a question that's actually kind of hard uh, or kind of challenging to answer. And the key uh, difficulty here is that ownership is obviously not exogenous. Right. And if you were just doing correlations between index ownership and outcomes, you would have to be concerned about admitted variables, right? Maybe their ownership is correlated with stock size, uh, liquidity, or ownership by other investors. And maybe it's these other things that matter, and it's not really about indexing. Right? So to overcome that challenge, a lot of the papers in this literature, uh, including some of my own, uh, have relied on generating exogenous variation or plausibly exogenous variation in index ownership because of which index a particular stock is assigned to, particularly people focus on the Russell 1000, 2000 index inclusion. Uh, now, I think the first paper that really used this setting in, in the, in, as a way to look at the effect of indexers on governance, now it wasn't the first to use this setting in general, but to look at indexing on governance, I think that was the Mullins 2014 paper. Okay? And then subsequent papers have used that as well. Now, there actually is a large debate about how best to use that setting. And I'm not gonna really get into that in this talk, uh, but I did wanna kind of flag that uh, for the audience. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about that, I would encourage you to take a look at three forthcoming critical finance review papers that uh, basically talk about this debate and provide guidance to researchers in terms of here are the things not to do in the setting and here are ways to use the setting in a potentially more compelling and convincing way. Okay, all right, but putting that aside, Let's talk about the evidence. Okay. So first, I'm going to focus on their direct impact. And I think the evidence here is certainly pointing in the direction that the big three do have a direct impact, that their voice matters and that firms respond to it. Right? So an example of that would be some of my own work uh, with Ian Appel and Don Keim uh, in the JFE. Right? So in that paper, we looked at a period from the late 90s to 2006. And we basically said, hey, during this time, the big three were very consistent and public and vocal about what they thought was a good governance structure, right? You could see it in their proxy voting guidelines, you could see it in their public letters, and that they consistently said things like board independence, that's a good thing. Uh, takeover defenses, they viewed as a bad thing, right? And basically what we show in the paper is that index ownership is in fact associated during this time period with companies having governance structures that are more aligned with the view of the big three, suggesting that they were exerting influence through voice. Okay. There's also more recent evidence that their voice matters, right? So for example, uh, there's my working paper with Vishal Gupta, David Matza, uh, Santa Mortal, and Luke Yang, 
And in that paper, we look at the big three's board gender diversity campaigns from 2017 and 18. Right. So in early 2017, State Street came out and basically said, we think all boards should have at least one woman on them. And if a company doesn't have that and they don't have a good reason for that, we're going to start voting against the reelection of existing directors. Vanguard followed suit with a similar uh, statement later in 2017. And then in 2018, BlackRock kind of upped the ante and said, hey, we're going to start voting against directors at companies that don't have at least two women on their board. Right. And so what we do in this paper is we do a very simple difference in difference pre versus post campaign and firms with a lot of big three ownership versus firms that did not to try to look at what was their impact, right? And our essence suggests they had a really big impact uh, in terms of getting companies to add women to their boards. And quantitatively, our numbers suggest that they account for at least three fourths of the increase in women being added to boards since 2016, okay? So they seem to be very important, very influential. Okay. And there is additional evidence that their voice matters. Uh, so for instance, there's a recent JFE paper that argues that, hey, once the big three started taking public stances on emissions and started engaging companies, we see companies lowering emissions, particularly once they targeted. Uh, there is this nice working paper that shows that index ownership is associated with companies being more likely to adopt value enhancing proposals and being less likely to have their managers propose value destroying proposals, again, suggesting that their behind the scenes influence matters, okay? So the evidence suggests that they can have an impact uh, when they focus on certain issues, okay? But I think one needs to be careful in sort of understanding that what that evidence is showing is that, yeah, when they adopt these low cost approaches, right? I'm gonna vote against directors uh, and they push for broad based reforms that don't require a lot of information about individual companies, they seem to be successful, okay? At the same time, there is other evidence suggests that there are limits to their influence, in particular, that they might be not particularly good at engaging in what is called high cost monitoring, right? Where you really do need to know what's going on with an individual company and be paying close attention to sort of have an effect there, right? So for example, there's this JFE paper by Schmidt and Fallenbrock, where they basically provide evidence that, hey, when indexing goes up, it looks as if the CEOs are giving themselves more power uh, and that the board appointments seem to get less shareholder approval and that the M&As that are being done uh, tend to get lower announcement returns. And their interpretation of this is that these high cost activities aren't being done particularly well when indexing goes up. Okay? Uh, I think that's a very compelling idea uh, and is definitely something that warrants further study. Um, because this, if you think about it, really undercuts the big three's sort of approach to governance, right? The big three actually are very upfront in saying, hey, yeah, where you have thousands of companies, we don't have the ability to sort of engage in this firm specific monitoring. But what they say they do is, well, we're gonna make sure that the overall governance structure, right? Board independence, things like that are good. And that if we do that right, then good decisions will fall from that, okay? But what this paper is potentially suggesting is that's not necessarily true. And that maybe these governance changes that they've been pushing are still not enough, right? And that you do really need this high cost monitoring as well, okay? Maybe they're not very good at that, okay? All right, let me now talk about their potential indirect impact on governance, in particular, their impact through other investors, All right? So one could argue that, hey, even if the index tracking institutions, the big three, even if they're not as able to engage in this high cost monitoring as some of the research shows, maybe their presence actually makes it easier for others to do that, okay? And such that maybe the net impact isn't negative, right? Now, why might that be? Well, a lot of reasons. One is if, if you think about it, their growth has inherently made ownership structures of companies more concentrated, right? And that could arguably make it less costly for an activist to target that firm, right? And that you don't need to track down as many individual investors to try to win them over to your side. It's easier for you to gauge support for your campaign and that you talk to the big three, you've now talked to 20% of the ownership or 25% of the votes, okay? Additionally, their presence could actually increase the likelihood of success for an activist, right? Because you have these investors that can't exit these positions, but they're maybe not happy with the managers, right? And so you have these very willing partners, right? And additionally, if you can just get one or two of these institutions to kind of express support, that can often be enough to get a manager to back down, okay, to the activists. So that's reasons why they might help, but there could be reasons why their presence could be bad for an activist. 
right? So even the activists, for instance, Bill Ackman early on was complaining, basically saying he thought these indexers had a conflict of interest and that they wouldn't side with the activists because they were worried about upsetting managers and hurting their other business relationships, right? You even had the owners uh, or the CEOs of some of these indexers, right? Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, basically saying we don't often agree with the activists, right? He said they're short-sighted, right? Whereas BlackRock's really focused on the long-term. Right. So it's unclear what their impact would be on an activist, whether they're helping or hurting them. So again, it becomes an empirical question. All right. So here, I think the evidence, again, is pointing in a direction that they do seem to be, have a positive impact on governance, right? And that their presence does seem to improve activists' ability to discipline managers, right? And so here I'm referring to my RFS paper with uh, Don and Ian. Uh, in that basically what we saw in the data is that when indexing ownership is higher in a particular stock, and an activist targets a company, they seem to be more willing to engage in expensive and ambitious campaigns. And importantly, they're more likely to actually succeed and get what they were asking for. Okay, now I should be careful here in that what we find is that they're mostly helpful, right? So if you're talking about campaigns where the activist was targeting things like increased payouts, changes in capital structure, things that the indexers don't really focus on, we didn't find any evidence that their presence is helpful there. Right. It's really when the activist is focusing on issues that the indexers talk about and care about that they seem to be helpful. Okay. Additionally, there's a nice working paper uh, by Manish Jha that argues that there's this indirect effect as well, and that activists, they're very aware of who the big owners are of a company when they target them and naturally tailor their campaigns, tailor the language they use, tailor what they're targeting in order to win over those investors. Right. Uh, and I think that's very intuitive, makes a lot of sense. You know, and even the activists acknowledged this, right? Ackman noted that, hey, if you're going to target a company with a short-term strategy that's going to hurt long-term value, then yeah, you're not going to win over the BlackRock. You're not going to win over the Vanguard, right? You got to pay attention to who the investors are and the fact that these institutions are large and are the big owners. Presumably, this has got to have an effect on what the activists are doing, okay? All right. So I do think there is this evidence of an indirect impact as well. The third set of findings I want to talk about is their degree of activeness, right? Uh, in terms of, they do seem to do something, they do seem to be engaged in certain ways, but are they as active or as engaged or as effective in monitoring as other institutions, right? And here, I think the evidence is kind of pointing us towards, no, right? They do do something, they are active in certain dimensions, but not as active as these actively managed funds, right? So for example, there's a nice working paper that looks at proxy fights. Right. And in that paper, they basically show, yes, the big indexers, they do seem to be active in these proactive fights, but they focus on different things, right? They focus more on firm fundamentals and less on stock performance. And the way in which they express dissent is much more subtle in how they do that, but they are doing that. Okay. But if you compare them against the actively managed funds, yeah, they're not as engaged and they're less likely to support the activists. Okay. There's also a nice uh, paper in the RFS uh, that looks at how much research these asset managers do, right? They basically document research by looking at how often they download filings from the SEC website before a shareholder meeting, right? And so that paper finds that yes, the indexers do engage in research, but it seems to be more narrow, more focused, right? In that they're more likely to do this research when there's a lot of shareholder proposals, when there's an ISS proposal that goes against managers or when there's an activist present, okay? But if you just look at the overall amount of research they're doing, yeah, it's not as much as what the active funds are doing. Okay, so they're engaged, but not quite as much. Okay. And then finally, oh, hold on here, presentation paused. Oh, give me a second here. Just one second. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post it on the Q&A. So when Todd finishes his prepared uh, talk, he will come back to these okay. questions. Sorry about Thanks. that. Don't know why it froze. All right, so that's the evidence on the degree of activism, okay? But there has been even more recent evidence uh, that's basically argued that, hey, they don't seem to monitor at all, right? And so here I'm referring to the recent RFS paper that was published earlier this year. Okay, and this paper points to a number of evidence that they argue suggests that these institutions aren't doing anything, right? And for instance, they point out that, hey, the big three, they don't file these Schedule 13D forms like an activist does. 
uh, if you look at their voting, they're more likely to vote with managers on these contentious proposals and less likely to vote against ISS. Okay, and they interpret this as evidence that they're not monitoring. Okay, now I would argue we need to be a, a little careful interpreting these type of results. I think they're harder to interpret. All right, so for example, uh, just because you don't file 13D doesn't mean you can't be engaged or active in other regards. It certainly means you're not being like a hedge fund. That's true but you can still be active in other dimensions. We have lots of evidence of that. Second, voting, against voting with managers and against ISS, you can easily flip the interpretation on that, right? Most of the rest of the literature argues that, hey, voting against ISS is evidence that you're paying more attention, right? And it correlates with other measures of paying attention and doing more research, right? And so you could argue that this is evidence that they're actually attentive, not that they're lazy, okay? So we have to be a little careful. That being said, that paper does have other findings that I do think are quite interesting uh, and are worth further exploration, All right? So for example, they show that in a more recent time period, index ownership is associated with a decline in CEO's pay performance sensitivity, uh, a decline in board independence, and not much of an impact on other aspects of governance, okay, that earlier papers had studied, including some of my own, okay? I think that's super interesting uh, and something we need to be looking at um, in terms of why. Why, do, why does this paper get different results, right? Uh, one possibility is maybe it's different identification strategy is what's important. Uh, you know, obviously you can always quibble with an identification strategy and I have some concerns with their approach. Or maybe it's because they're looking at a different time period, right? And maybe the impact of these indexers has shifted over time. Or maybe this is a time period where they weren't focused on board independence or CEO pay performance sensitivity. That was kind of 10, 15 years ago. And maybe it's looking at the wrong outcomes. I'm not sure. But I do think it's definitely worth looking at further. So to kind of wrap up, I think this is still an area where more research is needed. Okay, let me now move on to part two in terms of what is the importance of the fact that they own basically every stock in the economy for how managers behave. Okay, so I'll talk about the initial theory and then the initial evidence that suggests that they had a big impact. And then I think the more recent evidence suggests maybe not so much. Okay, so first, uh, common ownership, right? This ownership where you have an investor that owns both stock A and stock B, that type of overlap in ownership has been going up a ton in the US over the last few decades, right? And this figure is just an illustration of that. This is actually a, a figure from an earlier version of a, my JFE paper with Eric Gillia and Jerome Levitt. And here we're just measuring overlap in the ownership of a given stock pair or the average stock pair in the US over time. And we measured it using the Hansen and Lotz approach or the Ant and Polk approach. And basically you see this overlap goes up a ton. It goes up somewhere between 1600 to 4,000%, big increases, okay? The question is, is, does this matter what managers are doing, right? And there's an old theoretical literature to suggest that that type of common ownership could be really important, right? And it's quite intuitive, right? If I'm an investor and I own both firm A and firm B, I naturally would want manager A to think about how his or her actions are gonna affect the value of not just their firm, but the other stock in my portfolio, right? I want them to internalize the externalities of their action choices, right? So the question then is, is all right, well, is indexing causing this? Is this common ownership leading to this, okay? And I think it's fair to say that the initial evidence that came out here really was pointing into the direction of like, this common ownership matters. And it matters a lot for many, many different outcomes, right? We had papers arguing that their common ownership was affecting governance structures. It's affecting executive pay in terms of the structure of the compensation. Uh, and probably most prominently, and what got the most attention were the papers that argued that the growth of common ownership was leading to a reduction in product market competition, okay? Uh, and that got a lot of attention, uh, had a lot of impact in that policymakers were looking at this, you had legal scholars looking at this, and people basically saying, hey, the evidence suggests that common ownership, which presumably is being driven by indexing, is leading to bad outcomes. We need to do something about indexing, right? And so you had some arguing that we needed to be using existing antitrust laws to undo the horizontal ownership of these indexes. Uh, you had others arguing we should be using regulatory actions to limit these institutions' ability to offer index funds or maybe force them to just hold one stock in certain industries. These would be big changes to how that industry operates, right? Very important, very impactful papers, okay? And it's not hard to see why the indexers got a lot of attention here, 
right? And I'm pulling a table here from the JF paper that looked at the airline industry. And they put up basically who are the top five owners in a bunch of different industries. So here I put it for the six largest banks, but the paper also did it for airlines, pharmacies, technology. And basically you just look at who are the big owners, who consistently shows up, the big three, right? The mere fact that they become so huge, they're naturally gonna be the biggest owners in many firms. They're what's driving a lot of this common ownership, a lot of this overlap. Okay, so that's why they got a lot of attention. Even though the papers in this literature often didn't point directly at the indexers, it's very clear we're talking about indexers in many regards here. Okay, the question is, is does these indexers, do these indexers in their growth actually hurt competition, right? Uh, and I think after the initial papers, um, it's fair to say that there was a fair amount of pushback on this argument and that many kind of pointed out what are some flaws to the argument or potential questions, right? And so, for example, many were concerned with, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence in terms of what is the mechanism by which these indexers or these large asset managers would be able to somehow influence the specific policies of firms in certain industries in terms of their price and quantity choices. It just wasn't really clear what that mechanism was. The second question that sort of came up is whether it's plausible that these large managers that hold thousands and thousands of companies could actually think through and solve through this problem of how affecting competition in one industry would affect the overall portfolio, right? Sure, maybe if we could reduce competition in the airlines industry, benefits those stocks. But they would also need to think about how it affects the rest of the portfolio, which could be adversely affected. And then what's the net impact of that? Do we really think that they're able to solve that problem or that they're actually doing that? Because if not, then why would managers care about this? And then the third question that kind of came up is whether we should actually expect the growth in index ownership to have a meaningful impact on whether managers are going to internalize how their actions affect other companies, right? In that, if you think about it, if indexing is driving this overlap and the indexers tend to hold thousands and thousands of shares, do we really think that they're attuned or informed about what specific companies are doing in certain industries and how those managers' actions affected the overall portfolio? Because if not, why would the investors or the managers think about these investors in their overlap? Okay. And so I think sort of what this initial push was basically doing, or this response was saying, it seems like the pendulum has swung too far here, right? And that we went from this scenario where people are saying, oh, these investors are terrible for governance, they're lazy, they're not monitoring, they're not doing anything, to now this extreme of where they're able to solve through this complicated optimization problem, somehow exert a ton of influence and, and change managers' incentives at the firm level and make them make specific choices. It just seemed like a bit too far, okay? And I think the more recent papers in this literature have started to kind of go back and say, wait, we need to rethink this early evidence, right? So to give you an example of that, there's my JFE paper with Eric Gillia and Drone Levitt. In that paper, we basically point out that, hey, if you construct a model-driven measure of common ownership that really tries to take the ownership overlap and map that in using theory into how much it would actually impact a manager's incentives, uh, it's not clear that indexing and its growth is having much of an impact here. Okay. And the key idea of our model was that not all investors are fully attentive, right? Uh, and if the investor's not attentive to what the manager's doing or how that's affecting the overall portfolio, then the manager shouldn't factor that into their decisions, right? And the way we model the attention is basically saying, hey, the larger or the more important that stock is in the portfolio, more likely you're paying attention, right? That receives a lot of empirical support. It can be easily microfounded in theory as well, okay? We basically show that, hey, if you do this seriously and account for this, then the shift in manager's incentives, which we measured using our GGL measure, it has gone up over the last couple of decades, but nowhere near the level of the overlap, right? There's a distinction between overlap and its impact on incentives, right? And, and as a highlight of this, we show in the paper that you can have two stocks getting added to the same index. You'll see the overlap in the ownership structure go up because now they're being held by the same index funds. But the incentive of the managers, according to our measure, to think about the externality on the other firm, actually goes down because they're being held by institutions now that are less informed, less attentive to what's going on with each individual stock. Okay. I also think the more recent empirical evidence uh, in the literature has really begun to cast doubt on those early findings that argue that common ownership was important, right? So an example of that, uh, there's a nice RFS paper uh, by Llewellyn and Lowry, where they revisit a key identification strategy of that literature which was to use mergers in the asset management industry as a shock to common ownership. 
Okay. And what their paper does is basically shows that, hey, a lot of the variation, if you use that identification strategy, is coming from mergers that occur around the financial crisis. Moreover, the firms that are shocked by this are already different before the merger than firms that are not shocked by it. And that's important because there are exotic reasons to think that those firms might have trended differently after the crisis for reasons that have nothing to do with the change in common ownership. Right? And the paper basically shows that if you use a more careful control group, or if you look at shocks outside the financial crisis, you don't find evidence that common ownership matters. Okay? And then you have this forthcoming JF paper that kind of looks at the main measure in those early papers that was used to measure common ownership, this MHHID measure. And it basically points out that that measure is constructed of two key components. One is from the own and overlap in the ownership. And then the other part is from the market shares of each firm in that industry. And what the paper shows is that, hey, if you shut down the market share part of that measure, there's no correlation with outcomes anymore. Meaning it doesn't seem like it's the actual ownership variation that matters here, it was the endogenous market shares. Okay, again, kind of casting doubt on the findings of those early papers. And to be clear here, there's other papers that have also tried to cast doubt on this. For instance, in my paper with Eric and Derone, in our appendix, we redid some of the main tables from the airlines paper using our measure of common ownership, and we didn't find anything, right? Now, at some level, that's just very similar to the Dennis and all paper, because our measure doesn't include market shares, right? It only uses ownership variation, and that doesn't correlate with outcomes. Okay. And then there's a recent JFE paper that also provides a lot of evidence. It just doesn't seem to be much of a connection here. Okay. So I think the evidence is now pointing away from indexers matting here uh, for common ownership in managers' incentives. But I don't want to give the impression that I don't think common ownership is important at all uh, in that I do think that there are some newer studies, uh, some working papers that focus on the venture capital industry and private startups that provide some pretty compelling evidence the common ownership might be quite important there, okay? Uh, but to be clear here, this isn't really about indexing, right? We're not talking indexers here, we're talking venture capital, okay? Now, could indexing matter from a common ownership perspective? I think there could be scenarios where maybe it matters, right? If you could think of an actionality where some type of broad-based, low-cost engagement strategy by them could get firms to internalize actionalities, maybe. Um, maybe something like emissions, I'm not sure. but. It, it has to be, I think, much more specific in terms of if they're going to have an effect. All right. So let me spend the remaining uh, 10 minutes uh, in my third part of the talk talking about what I sort of view as the re, uh, unanswered questions of literature. Right? And as you're going to see, a lot of these questions are going to kind of get at what's the value implications, what's the net impact, what's motivating these big three. I think that's sort of the current gap in the literature. Okay. All right. So I have five questions I think I'd like to see the literature tackle next. The first question I think is what is motivating the big three, right? I think in my personal view, the evidence is pretty clear that if they set their mind to something and they have a low cost way of doing it, they can push for broad-based changes, right? For example, the board gender diversity campaigns, okay? The question then becomes, why did they do that? Why did they choose to focus on certain things? What's their motivation? Right? I think that's really important if we want to think about what are the value implications of their choice to be active in this regard. Right? So for example, if they're doing this because they think that these changes are going to improve firm value and going to improve fund performance, right? and there are reasons to think that, right? the Llewellyn, Llewellyn paper documents that they do have quantitative monetary incentives here, uh, then that's good for shareholders. It's value enhancing motives. Okay, another potential motive, uh, which is something I'm working on in a work in progress with Ian, uh, Don, and a PhD student here, June, and Chehi Shin at the Federal Reserve Board, is that maybe they care and are engaged because they're not 100% indexed, right? If you look at Vanguard and BlackRock, 25% of their portfolios on average are actively managed mutual funds, right? So maybe it's the presence of these active managed funds that give them motive to be engaged and improve value, right? I think some often overlook that Vanguard, by its sheer size, its active funds, the total assets under management in Vanguard's active funds is the same size as Fidelity as a whole. Vanguard is one of the largest active fund managers in the US. Maybe that's given the motive to be engaged. Okay, And again, that could be good for shareholders. At the same time, one can easily come up with alternative motives that would not necessarily be about uh, improving shareholder returns. Um, so for example, some have argued that maybe they engage in these type of activities because they're trying to attract fund flows, right? So maybe they engaged uh, in the diversity campaign because they thought it would attract 
fund flows from socially minded investors. Okay. Others have argued that maybe they're doing this to stave off regulation, right? They know they're becoming bigger. People see them having potential, a lot of influence, and they're worried about being regulated. And a way to kind of keep that away is to be seen as good stewards doing good things. Okay. And then third, some say maybe they're just self-dealing, right? They're just using other people's money to advance their own view of the good, right? For example, maybe Larry Fink likes getting up there and using his bully pulpit to take certain positions, not because he thinks it's going to improve stock returns, but because it just wins him a claim in the media, right? So again, if these type of things are driving them, then it's not necessarily clear that their actions are going to benefit shareholders. Okay, so I think this motivation is a big question. The second question I think we haven't really thought much about yet is, does it matter where the voting power in these institutions resides, right? Because there are a lot of different ways in which an institution could do the voting, right? One way is you centralize all of it in an in-house proxy voting group that kind of votes all the funds in the same direction. Another way is you let each individual fund make their decision, okay? Or maybe you let the investors in the funds make their decisions. Now, historically, the way it's been done is in-house proxy voting groups, right? The fund families typically vote as a block. Makes sense. It's likely to give them more influence. Okay, but that's actually been changing in recent years, right? So, for example, in 2019, Vanguard announced it's going to start letting its outside sub-advisors uh, of its actively managed funds do their own voting, okay? Vanguard's in-house proxy voting group is not going to be doing it for them anymore, right? BlackRock this past fall announced that it's gonna start letting the investors in some of its funds choose their own voting, right? And I think we need to better understand what the impact of that's gonna be, right? If they're sort of giving others the right to vote, no longer voting as a block, is this gonna affect their influence? Is it gonna affect what they choose to focus on? Uh, and so on. I think that's a very much open question. Third question, I think we need more understanding of what their more indirect impacts are. Now, to be clear, there has been papers that looked at the impact on the hedge funds and the activists, but I don't think there's been much in terms of what is their impact on just actively managed mutual funds, right, which can be very important from a governance perspective, right? So, for instance, is their growth causing the less informed active funds to exit? That could be potentially good. Uh, is it affecting which stocks the remaining active funds decide to hold or where they focus their attention? Uh, is it affecting how much information acquisition these active fund managers do or how active would they trade on it? I don't know, right? But it seems like the answer to these questions would obviously have implications for governance, okay? Uh, and this is something uh, and some new work in progress. I have the PhD student here, Jayanne and Don Kine. We're hoping to provide some answers here. And I think we have some really interesting preliminary results in this regard, okay? But I think in general, there's a lot more scope for room uh, work here. Fourth question, it's kind of, what's the overall value implications, right? If you think about it, a lot of what these indexers seem to do is these one size fits all, these check the box approaches to governance, right? Because that's an easy thing for them to do at relatively low cost. The problem is, is that we know that optimal governance structures, and the big three are aware of this as well, are likely to vary across companies, right? But if they're kind of pushing a broad reform on, on everyone, because they think on average it's good, maybe it's not the right change for some firms, right? And so maybe these changes are not beneficial to some companies and it's detrimental. I don't think we have a lot of evidence on this, but I do think it is something worth exploring. And then finally, my fifth question I'd like to see the literature go after is what is their overall net impact on stock performance and stock value, right? And I think the answer to that is gonna depend on a lot of things. And there's recent theory to you know, suggest that, that their net impact is gonna depend on what kind of factual you're thinking about and other conditions in the market, right? So just kind of give you an example. If you think of the big three as just replacing these dispersed small investors that we're not paying attention, not monitoring, then yeah, their growth could actually be good for governance on net. But if they're replacing the more actively uh, active funds, those that do engage in monitoring and arguably more monitoring than the index funds, then maybe it's not a good thing on net, okay? So I think trying to better understand that net impact uh, is gonna be really, really hard. I'm not sure someone's gonna be able to do this convincing, convincingly, uh, but it is a very important unanswered question that we still have out there. Okay, all right, so let me just conclude. Uh, overall, I think indexing uh, and its growth and the growth of the big three is having an impact on governance. Uh, it is sort of shifting things. And the main way in which they appear to engage in governance is by adopting these low cost tactics. For instance, they're going to vote against your directors by pushing for broad based changes that are very easy to observe and uh, follow, things like gender diversity.
on boards, right? And they seem to have a lot of influence when they decide to do that. Okay. At the same time, there's a lot of evidence that they don't exert influence in other dimensions. For instance, I don't think they're having an impact from a common ownership perspective. And there's also evidence that they don't engage very well in high cost monitoring activities, uh, which could be bad, or they're not as active as the actively managed funds. Okay. Uh, now, their presence could make it easier for others to do that, but what's in that impact? Not clear, right? And so that's sort of where I think we're at. We need to better understand what's motivating them. We need to better understand what their net impact is and what the other implications are, right? So overall, I still think this is a very exciting area to be doing research and that there's still a lot to be done. All right. Uh, so thank you uh, for indulging me uh, for the last 45 minutes. Uh, and again, uh, apologies for any errors in terms of how I described someone's research or if I didn't cite someone's particular paper. Uh, but thank you again. And I look forward to your questions. All right. Uh, thank you Pat, so much. You're the best person to give this lecture. Actually, some of the authors of the papers you cited are in the audience. So <laughs> I suppose if you said anything wrong, they will reach out to you directly. No, I don't think I'm that's sure the they case. will. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much. So there are um, several questions in the uh, Q and A's. I'm going to take them mostly by the order when they came in, but I will take an easy one, which is also my personal interest at the end. So this is from Lisa Wolf. Uh, Lisa asks, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Okay, that's not ask, that's a statement. Do you think there is any association between indexing and dual class share uh, structures? That's a good question. Um, so, the indexers have been clear, or at least they were 15, 20 years ago, that dual class share structures is not something that they're a big fan of in terms of they think it makes it harder for shareholders to exercise voice. Uh, now, my paper, the JFE paper with Ian and Don, provided suggested evidence that their ownership is associated with firms being less likely to have that structure, uh, at least back in the early 2000s. Um, but more recent work um, you know, cast out and whether that result is as robust um, as some of our other findings. So I, I think it's still an open question. Um, All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the question, there, there's another question which is pretty close to my heart. You touched on the board gender diversity. This is another dimension that is a hot topic of people debate a lot. Any thoughts on big three's role in ESG issues like carbon disclosures? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, sort of where they've been focused more recently are on issues of diversity, um, sustainability disclosures, uh, carbon emissions. Um, now it's uh, racial diversity on boards is the new policy that they're implementing starting this year. Um, my suspicion is, is that in some of these aspects, they are likely to be influential, right? Just kind of based on my work on board gender diversity, it seemed like they had a big impact um, because it's kind of a policy that's very easy for them to observe and very easy for them to sort of in a low cost way hit companies with this voting against directors. Uh, so to the extent that they can use a similar strategy with racial diversity uh, or say sustainability disclosures, uh, I tend to think that they will have an impact on these issues. Um, but again, I think the question is what's motivating them, uh, why they're doing that, and whether this is actually going to be beneficial to the shareholders of those funds and of those companies. Uh, that I think is a question we don't know the answer to. I'm happy there are so many open questions for the scholars in the audience. So a question comes from anonymous attendee, BlackRock CEO promotes the new concept about the purpose of the investee company. I don't know whether you have heard about this, Todd, I haven't. How do you explain this form uh, from the perspective of weak governance? Uh, so actually, I'm not quite sure what this question is getting at. Uh, so this is something I would be happy to talk about offline because uh, I'm uh, not really right. sure what they're going at there. So Todd is going to write his answers to the Q&As and we're going to post that uh, to all the questions, regardless whether he is going to answer today uh, or not. So let me start from the top. The research appeared to ascribe the effect of board diversity to an individual actor, when in reality, many other investors have held strong views about, say, board diversity for a lot longer than say, stay straight. How do you address these issues? What's the role of other investors besides these big three? Yeah, that's a great question. So clearly, the big three were not the first to sort of talk about this. You had some very prominent pension funds in California talking about this years beforehand. Uh, 
Um, but I think what's quite telling uh, in the data is that if you look at the speed at which co companies are adding women to their boards prior to 2017, it was pretty steady and pretty slow. Uh, but then something clearly changed around 2017 and the speed at which women are being added to boards. Uh, and the evidence suggests it's really coming from the big three's ownership in that their ownership didn't predict changes in diversity prior to 2017, but it starts to do that in 2017. And the timing really matches up. Like State Street started in 2017, that's when their ownership seems to start mattering. BlackRock starts in 2018, that's when their ownership seems to start mattering um, in terms of they also target certain companies. So I think the evidence really is pointing in terms of they were quite influential, um, but I'm not saying that those earlier attempts didn't have an impact. It's just if we're talking about since 2017, these three seem to have had a big impact. It's also worth noting that they also got other investors to start talking about this. So there were spillovers, right? So for example, ISS later in 2018, basically adopted a similar policy and pointed to the big three and said, hey, the big three have been doing this. It's clear that investors care about this. We're gonna do a similar voting policy. Um, and to the extent that ISS has an impact and they respond to the big three, again, it's just evidence that they're important. That's a great ending of your answer because there's a question just related that related to that from Gerardo. How, how do you see the role of proxy agencies in the like of stewardship who also have no budget and hands to evaluate thousands of companies in such short period of time prior to the annual general assembly? I think this is another heated topic. Uh, there are many discussions on this. Considering the recent creation of the Independent Oversight Committee chaired by Professor Stephen Davis. So how do you Yeah, that? so that's a that's a very different question in different <laughs> literature. Uh, and I can see some of the audience members here are much more of an expert there than I am. So I'll kind of let them speak to that in their own papers. Um, but you know, I think the impact of the indexers is quite a bit different than proxy advisors. I think the evidence is clear the proxy advisors have an impact, um, but indexers have their own separate impact. They're actually uh, less likely to follow ISS, um, and so it's it's different. Um, and so I'll kind of leave it at that. All right, thank you. You just touched the ball. <laughs> they, were, yeah. they are working in different areas. Okay, so there's a very long comment, and at the end, there's a question from Eric K. These major investors have clearly had major impact on corporate governance, including climate change. However, specifically on global warming, many companies are responding to this pressure by putting reduced carbon footprint metrics into their business plan and executive incentives. However, another one, many companies with large footprints are selling these businesses to private companies. There are examples where those assets are getting even dirtier now under private ownership. There is a possibility that under the rare circumstance of shutting this dirty business as shutting, as, as shutting would do, major short-term damage to the company and society. What should be, what should the large investors do about this? I think this is not only a private company, but also certain things moving along supply chains or outsourcing things outside US. So what's your general view about this? Yeah, so it is true that these big investors, including the big three, have uh, put a lot more focus now on emissions and sustainability. Um, but I think the overall impact is still to be seen. Um, I mean, there is the one paper in the JFP that argues that there was an impact. But this is one of those issues that sort of the question alludes to of where the outcome is potentially harder to observe. Uh, and if it's harder to observe, then do we think that these investors who hold thousands and thousands of companies and might have a harder time knowing this would have as much of an impact. Um, I think that's, it's an open question uh, of how big of an impact they're having here. Like for instance, they've kind of focused recently on, you need to have a sustainability disclosure uh, as a company. They can easily observe, did you do that? Now, does that having that sustainability disclosure actually then affect what you do as a company? I don't know about that. Um, I think it's an important question that we need more work on. Right. So uh, this question is a bit challenging. I'm, I'm eager to hear your view on this. You said a number of times that managers own securities with quotation mark on own. Um, uh, however, the fund management firm does not own. So the funds own the securities. Those funds have fund boards and external clients. For example, in uh, segregated mandates uh, like 
public funds. Perhaps a further stream of research would be useful to look at the internal governance of the managers and how they set policies and their accountability. This is related to what you emphasize in the future research. Can you elaborate more on this task? Yeah, I, I think this uh, question is right and that this is something we need to better understand, right? So they, they aren't the actual owners. They're kind of acting as fiduciaries on behalf of the true owners. And so some of the questions that then go out there is what's motivating them? Are they really acting on the interests of the investors? Uh, it's not obvious because there are reasons to think that they might not be. Uh, and then in terms of how they exert influence, right? Uh, if they do it an in-house voting thing where they kind of vote everything as a block versus let's let the fund managers decide, which is where Vanguard's kind of going now, or let's let the investors vote now, which is kind of where BlackRock's going. Um, I think it's very open in terms of how this matters, in terms of how they internally organize the decision-making of where the fund's going to vote uh, and how it's going to affect the overall influence of the institution. If you're not voting as a block anymore, are the managers going to pay as much attention to these bigger issues that you're trying to push them on? Uh, I don't know. Uh, and these are very recent changes that are occurring. So I, I think it's sort of to be seen. Great. Thank you. So that will remain as an open question for the next couple of years. Before I tell, just give us another paper. Or <laughs> some people in the audience will produce some uh, high quality research on that. So a little bit um, diversion from the main line. I don't know whether you have a good answer to this question. Can you talk about the practice of share lending? How prevalent it is with the big three and what impact this has on governance? That's a good question. Uh, so that I know less about. So I know there is a evidence that institutions in general seem to call back uh, their shares prior to important votes. Now, do they separately have anyone separately looked at the extent to which the big three do that, I don't know. Uh, they do make a big business, make a lot of money off lending their shares. Um, but that is a good question in terms of how much they're pulling back um, their lending before a key vote. I don't, I don't know if someone's documented that, and I apologize if someone has, and I'm, I'm overlooking your research. Um, All right, uh, thanks. Um, here is another question. So there, there are several more questions. I won't be able to read all of them to you. Um, but I'm going to pick up some of them. So, okay, so BlackRock uh, has said 75% of your funds need to have net zero carbon emissions. Practice change, uh, not just disclosure. How would that change? This is the last question on your screen. Uh, on their passive side of the business, if they do it on the active side. This is again related to your early discussions, right? So if there are multiple funds. Yeah, passive so. And indexing. Yes. Um, you know, again, if BlackRock is able to come up with an easy way to sort of observe whether a company is doing this, uh, like there's an easy measure for this, uh, then I do think if it's something that doesn't require a lot of information on their part or cost to acquire that information, then I do think that they get to exert influence, right? They've illustrated that if they really want to push something they can start casting votes against directors at these companies and directors don't like that. Uh, they seem to be responsive to that. Um, and so, yeah, I do think there's scope for them to do this, but it has to be something I think that doesn't require a lot of cost for them to actually know what you did here. Um, otherwise, I think it's a bit implausible to think that a governance group of 20 individuals managing a portfolio of 10,000 companies can really know uh, whether that company did what they were supposed to do. Um, so it's just a question of, can they easily observe the outcome that they're trying to push firms towards? All right, there's a question I'm gonna push you a little bit, but you can choose not to, to respond to that. It's uh, more related to the interactions or dynamics between these indexers and active um, shareholder activists, more hedge funds. So this is from Matt. Um, I like the way you have framed the difference between high cost monitoring and otherwise. It is an important distinction. Active manager research analysts cover 30 companies max, Passive uh, governance analysts cover hundreds. The math doesn't work for the high cost monitoring. I think this is more than just this active and passive in terms of analysts, but also in terms of different types of um, shareholder so-called activism or lack of activism. So I'm thinking more about mutual funds and indexers in particular and hedge funds, uh, the dynamics between them. Yeah, uh, so I think the evidence is 
you know, kind of point in the direction that if you're talking about these high cost activities, uh, they don't seem to be doing that. And I actually think the big index is very clear, like we don't have the resources or interest in doing that. That's why they kind of pick these broad based governance reforms to focus on. Uh, and so I think the evidence kind of points there. And the same with the common ownership literature. My view of the common ownership literature is you're in essence assuming that they can engage in this high cost activities if they're exerting influence. Um, but I think the evidence is suggesting that they're not. Um, I think the question is, is what's happening to the active funds in terms of how are they responding to the growth of the indexers, right? And so there's some work on the activists, including some that I did that suggests that they're responding to the indexers and maybe they benefit from their growth. But I don't think we know much about what the active fund managers are doing uh, because they are important from a governance perspective. Um, and you know, if they're kind of being pushed out of the market, uh, then maybe that's not good uh, for overall net governance. Um, but if maybe it's the less informed ones that are being pushed out, or maybe these active fund managers become more engaged in certain types of stocks, you know, um, there could be, it's hard to sort of tease out what the overall impact is, but I don't think we really know what's going on with the active funds. But do I think the indexers are engaging in high cost uh, monitoring? No, I don't think the evidence suggests that they are. All right, thanks. I'm going to read one more question and one more comment. Uh, this question is, again, pushing you from, from the audience, not me. Do you have some research agenda about index corporate governance focusing on emerging markets or developing markets such as China? Or uh, any existing results about index corporate governance in other countries? I read this question, I suppose this comes from the other side of the globe, they are past midnight already. So I have to give uh, that audience the chance to hear your response. I don't know how much you know about this corporate governance or uh, indexing outside US. No, I don't know that much. And, and you know, this question makes me think I should have added a sixth question <laughs> that the literature needs to be looking at is the importance of indexing, not just in the US, because the literature is focused primarily on the US. Um, so sort of knowing the growth of indexing in other countries and what that might mean, very much an open question. Uh, yeah. All right, that's great. Um, so the last one I'm going to read, uh, I'm skipping some questions, but Todd will write up um, his answers to all the questions uh, long or short. So this is from Gerardo. He said, excellent presentation, congratulations <laughs> to you all. So that's uh, the last comment I'm going to read. I have two more slides. Uh, it's more about um, what's coming up next. So, okay, sorry. Um, I can go back to this. Um, hold on. I mess up my own um, thing. So um, Cassidy, can you share my slide deck? Yes, if you can, June, unshare your screen, I should okay. be able to I share thought, mine. All right. So I didn't save that on the desk, so I just opened that on my email. All right, just give me a sec. Sorry about that. All right, it's coming up. Can you roll to page six? Uh, page five, please. All right, right here. So this is a quick summary. I put uh, Todd's bullet point at something he didn't put there. So essentially um, what we can learn, uh, what I learned personally from this talk is big three, they do adopt policies or strategies that fit their profile because they're big and they're essentially everywhere. These are the old low, uh, low cost tactics uh, that, go, uh, that are targeting at broad based changes. Um, say like for gender diversity or emission, climate change and so on. So this is what they are doing. This can be good in general, but one size fit all may um, present some new challenges. And uh, they're less able to do this high cost monitoring, but their presence might facilitate activists ability to monitor. I put the uh, blue ink because uh, last lecture by Professor Bra from Duke, he did presented that uh, the hedge funds tend to target firms with more institutional ownership and they are more likely to be successful in those campaigns. So that's kind of related to what Todd talked about. And the bullet point I didn't have is I think there's quite some discussion about uh, does common ownership hurt competition? 
And if it does, what is the mechanism? So I think Pat said that pretty clearly, there's no obvious or reliable mechanism at this point. And the more important thing for many audiences is what are the open questions, right? What are the motivation, net impact, and other implications uh, of these indexing um, in investors? So that's kind of uh, what I learned from today. The next page, please, Cassidy. To link this back to the hedge fund activism where Professor Broff concluded that uh, hedge fund activism is good for shareholders, both in the short run and long run. So last time he concluded that these hedge funds are creating values rather than just doing financial engineering. And he believed a uh, hedge fund has a longer horizon than people tend to perceive the short term, like you come in, you pay out um, the money and then you leave. Uh, he believed that's different. I think the last point tied um, these two talks. So hedge fund activism is a market approach to corporate governance without seeking control. I think these indexers or these big three in general, this is also market approach because they have this ownership and they're not seeking control for sure. They do have their voice, they do have their influences. So hedge fund has much smaller ownership while these indexers has much bigger one. They don't cover 100%. What will be the dynamics among different types of investors? Here, we're talking about institutional investors. It can be other investors as well. So I think that remains to be seen. Uh, the last slide, please. So here uh, we are uh, entering into the last lecture for the spring season. And that's number three of the mini series on data and governance that's uh, on May 5th, the future of cybersecurity. So this is going to be given by Justin, Charlie and Jeffrey from McKinsey. Announcement will follow. Thank you again for your attention, for coming to our seminar uh, lecture series. Thank you for your support. Thanks again, uh, Marco, um, Elaine and Todd. Any questions, please feel free to email us at icg at indiana.bu. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Good Thank night you. to everyone. Good early morning to people in Asia. Good afternoon. Bye. Thank you.